I just can't imagine life without music. It just provides an outlet for everything, for every kind of emotion. It is something that people desperately need. It's a special way in which we can touch other people and inspire each other and challenge each other. Music has this extraordinary resonance in our souls and the string quartet is at the pinnacle of that kind of human communication. If I had the choice between playing a solo and playing in an ensemble, I would always choose playing in an ensemble. I just love playing with other people. I think you could be a bit more there, Steph. Well, I, I mean, let's hear it, but I think you could... You could still have more. When you play together with someone, it's an exchange of ideas. For me, that's the foundation of all music that's when the music really starts to come alive. Originally, chamber music was written for a chamber, as in a room. But for me, the string quartet is the most perfect form of chamber music. In a quartet, you are playing one part, but you're the, you're the person. So you're the soloist, if you like, for that part. The format of a string quartet is so exposed. Yeah, uh, one before 19. Maybe it could be a bit broader. Yeah. But do you go down? Is it down? I go down, but yeah. it does, it's not marked in any way. You're forced to create everything on your own. That's a freedom, but it's also a challenge. There's no room for passengers. There's no room for people not being at the top of their game. It is so intimate. Every sound is picked up by the other three around you. The feeling of playing in a quartet is all encompassing because you really are engaged, if you're playing good quartets, in conversation that's often way above you. You're having really terrific debates written by the masters of, of music. People often ask, you know, the difference between ensemble playing and solo performing. Knowing that you've got comrades at arms, I think for most people is a terrific thing. They really are my musical family. We are on the road together, we rehearse together. It's to the point where sometimes you play, you play a note and they'll know how you're feeling on a particular day. We've seen each other go through highs and lows of, of personal life as well as our own trials and tribulations with the instrument. A string quartet comprises of four instruments. The biggest is the cello, that's at the bottom of the four. My name is Tippi and I'm from Finland. I started going to cello lessons when I was six years old. I was put together with other children and started trying to make music together, basically from day one. And so it was always a team effort. Oh, Tippi, I just adore his playing. I, I just love the way that everything is heart on sleeve. Tippi's sound is magical and his spontaneity is incredible. He's our beloved principal cellist. He's like a pig in mud with quartets. I play a Brothers Marty cello from the year 1616. This cello is quite versatile. 
So it's very adaptive to the many roles that the cello often plays within the chamber group. The supportive nature of its sound is very nice to work with. And then there's me, the violist. I'm Stephanie Farrens. I can't imagine my life without music. I think it's how I express myself. Having my instrument on me is when I feel like I am Steph. Steph has the most wonderful, rich, warm sound, and she's like that as a person as well. Hearing a string quartet for the first time was a life-changing moment for me. And particularly with my instrument, I think the viola shines in this medium. If you look at a viola, it generally looks relatively similar to a, a violin. It's a lot heavier and bigger, though. My viola was made in 2016 in Berlin. There are centuries between when my instrument and the other three instruments in the quartet were made, which is also, I think, an incredible thing that instruments today can cohabitate despite having hundreds of years between them. So my hands have been the first to play this and it's also incredible to know that it may outlast you. My name's Helena. I'm playing the second violin in the string quartet. I moved to Australia when I was 23. I came for a year. 27 years later, I'm still here. I started the violin playing in the London Suzuki group when I was five. I think if I didn't play the violin, I wouldn't be me. I, I wouldn't feel the whole person. I went on my very first tour when I was seven to Belgium and Paris, believe it or not. And uh, that paved the way for the rest of my life, really. That's what my life has been like ever since, being on tour, playing the violin. Helly is incredibly humble and open to always be exploring and learning. To be a good second violinist involves morphing and changing like a chameleon. She plays first violin exquisitely, but Helly seems to revel playing the role of second violin. She really understands it. There's this enveloping presence with her personality, but also with her leadership. It's really important in a, in a group that you have balance of things. So if Richard needs to be experimental, then we have the foundation of the orchestra. And that, and for me, that's Helly. She's the one who keeps us in place. This beautiful violin was made in Parma in 1759 by a maker called Guadagnini. I fell in love with it instantly because it was so dark and rich and gorgeous. I do love playing second violin parts on it because it has got that richness in the bass. They're extraordinary things to have in your possession. And it's my third child. <laughs> I have two children and this is my third one. <laughs> My position in the Ravel String Quartet is marked as violin one, but the violins really are quite equal in this quartet. My name is Richard Tonietti, and I'm the artistic director of the Australian Chamber Orchestra, proudly. It's very difficult to find a string player who began their musical journey past the age of 10. Some people ask, when was it decided that you'd be a musician? I was four, and it was that first lesson, and never looked back. Well, I've been playing in the orchestra with Richard for 27 years, so I know him rather well, and I'm still inspired by the way that his brain works and his mind works, and 
and he keeps going and is always thinking of new things and has this endless energy, is extraordinary. This is a Guaneri del Gesù, and it was born in 1743 in Italy. The only way to describe my connection with it is through sound. It's dark and rich and yeah, it's my soul, my character. It's my voice box. That's the thing. See, that's the thing about being a violinist. You have to go out and find a voice box. Whereas a singer, of course, it's here. We're exploring a piece that we know very well and that we've played a lot. Ravel only wrote one string quartet and we're exploring his second movement. I think as musicians, we are so lucky these days to be able to play such a vast array of music. It's like a language. There is so much history behind something and it vastly affects the way we play. Ravel was studying at the time in Paris he was only 28 when he wrote this piece. He uses the different colours that the different instruments can make in a very, very imaginative way. You learn so much when playing his music about colour and blending and sound. And I just love the French Impressionist sound world that it takes you into. in the early part of the 20th century. During the age of Ravel, you know, with the extraordinary birth of many different art movements, this new found perfume called Impressionism came out of the visual imagination of the likes of Monet. Ravel and Debussy were called the Impressionists, and we know that they've, especially Debussy, hated that term. But you can't remove Ravel from that context. You have to think of him in the context of what was going on visually. Impressionism is a very essential way to experience music. It really transports you to a particular time, to a particular place. You can imagine French being spoken at you. You just have to let go when you play this movement. It can't feel ever too careful. It's, it's rustic and it's wild. It seems that he always had one ear cocked towards the heritage of his mother's homeland, which is Spain and the Basque territories. And it's been suggested that the second movement is an Iberian dance. The second movement is written in three parts. So A is, you know, one mood, and then B is a, is a contrasting mood. And then a recapitulation where the A section comes back you come through this bustling first section where everything seems to be happening. It's just like a busy Paris street where people are going to the cafe. And all of a sudden, around the corner, this middle section just takes us to another place. You hear this bell-like viola. Boom! And then it takes you into this completely different world. Ravel slows it right down and turns it into a beautiful smoky haze. That does come from Monet, doesn't it? Of just finding out of colour a mood. It's so embalming and then he wakes you up and takes you back
no one can say in the world that, oh, I've mastered the second movement of the Royal String Quartet. Such a thing doesn't exist. Even though it's a piece that we've played often and it's in our repertoire, every time it's necessary to go back to it and not so much relearn it, but reimagine it. If you come back to the piece weeks, months, years later, you can look at it quite differently. And I think that reassessment, that re-evaluation of, of great pieces such as the Ravel String Quartet is, is imperative. The first thing that you need to do is to study the score. So you're, you're just visually going through it and looking at different techniques that the score might entail. There's so much that goes into preparing for a string quartet concert and rehearsal. So much of it can also be done away from the instrument looking deeply into the score and the history behind a particular piece. Technically at home, looking at your own part and preparing as a individual instrumentalist is important. Certain bits will come together more naturally once we're all together. And you can sort of get an eye for what you need to practise individually and what there's no point in practising unless you're with other people and working out how to play a particular passage. And then for me, it's a lot of slow practice to unlock those hurdles and technical issues. It's a very personal thing of how do you practice. Like everyone has their own different way. Some have to practice very little. I, I think I'm one of the ones that have to practice a lot. Like with many other things in life, sometimes you have a, a little flow of good playing and you're in a happy place with your playing and then that might take a turn and, and you have to rebuild that again. It's important to practice on different levels as well. Sometimes, you know, if I haven't practiced for a bit, I, I think, oh, the instrument is sounding a bit stiff, you know, and I go, oh, oh it's just not working properly. And then I look into myself and then I practice and suddenly the instrument miraculously has a better resonance. So it's, it's about me and my relationship with it rather than just the instrument. The cello is a rather big instrument, so I have to be in a strong state to be able to be freed from the physical burden of playing the cello. The whole body is always kind of uh, involved in the process of making good sound. It always comes from being, being relaxed and being kind of in control and being aware of what your whole body is doing. Perhaps most importantly, what my back is doing and how that is supporting me kind of behind the cello and giving me the foundation of not having to worry about what my hands need to do. Because there's still the parts of my body that have to execute the actual playing side of things, but the hands wouldn't be able to work or the arms wouldn't be able to work perfectly unless your whole body is kind of in tune and, and uh, helping out. I think when you're putting your, your heart and soul into a performance, it's a very physical thing because you're holding your arm up like that for hours on end and like that. And it's all about balance. It's not just your arms that are moving, but often you're standing and this requires so much strength and power from the body. But you wouldn't want it to be any other way, really, um, because it's such an emotional outpouring when you're playing. I had time off when I had my children and one of the things I noticed that I missed, apart from the actual music and playing the music, was the physicality of playing the instrument and how much it is really a part of me. So that keeps me going. This is the bow. The bow it makes some friction when you draw it against the strings. The bow is always the expressive tool on the violin. So much of how we phrase in music is about singing and breathing like a singer would in order to create a phrase. We always use our bow as our breath and it's very important for string players to often think about singers and how they articulate different things like consonants to vowels. There's so much articulation that we can find in our bows like if we were to speak with our voice boxes. Yeah, and but I, I still think you could get this that you could just get a bell as well.
This is the transition that Ravel uses between the A section and the B section. It's a terrifying bar to play in concert that violists usually dread because somehow time just stops and you're left hanging there. He's written a diminuendo, which is to get softer. And this for me is really strongly found in a down bow where you can just emphasize the beginning of the bar and then let it just dissolve and disappear as you bow through the note. If we were, for example, to start that section on an up bow, it's very difficult because you're working against gravity and somehow when we breathe and we let the sound just come out of our arm moving with gravity, it creates a completely different effect, like an out breath as opposed to an in breath. in the middle, it goes into a completely new sound world. The second violinist and the violist has this passage that is sensuous and velvety and it creates an incredible effect when the second violin and viola are exactly on par with the same colour. The viola and I, we're going up and down together, moving in tandem. And it's like a very intimate conversation that we're having. If I have a passage like this with one of my colleagues, we need to agree on the phrasing. This is written so that you can do the same bowing as the phrasing. It's like sort of a long breath out and then a shorter one in fact. Like... get the first two beats out and then back again. It's almost like waves on the shore. You know, you can imagine it coming in and then quickly going out again, then coming in again. And you get that movement. You can imagine a dance being like that as well, can't you? One, two, it's like a waltz, three. One, two, three. Also, we need to work out and agree on the sound color that we make. I think when Steph and I started playing this together, we pretty much had the same idea. Like a lot of Ravel and Impressionist music, you kind of instinctively know that the sound should be more. More covered, kind of dusty. And he makes it even more apparent by using the mute. This is a mute. the added mute, which makes it sound more foggy, not just softer, but it's a form of expression. In Italian, bowing the string is called arco. That's the word that we use. And the other one being pizzicato. Pizzicato is when string players, rather than using their bow, they pluck the string with their fingers. The majority of this movement, I'm playing pizzicatos. We use our fingertips to, I guess, create a kind of a round sound. You can use any finger you like. They all sound a bit different. Like with the bow, there are so many different colours that we can create with pizzicato. The amount of flesh that you use, how close you are to the bone or the nail, also your point of contact, where you're plucking, creates vastly different sounds. Double stopping is when I'm plucking two strings at the same time. It's a nice technique to build the expression of the piece. So two notes and two strings, three strings at the same time, or even rolling it.
In this movement, there's an effect that bounces from the cello line into the viola line as the pizzicato figure rises in pitch. And here, we are absolutely the same character and colour, and it's, it's very challenging for the viola line to yo pa 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 to jump, jump from what the cello line, the exact colour and sound that they've created so the audience doesn't know what instrument is playing at that particular time. Great. And then here, why don't you be twangy? Uh, exactly, yeah, just, yeah, great. Being extremely aware of the contact point of where the cellist is on the on the instrument, and as he goes up, ba, 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 it it increases in dynamic. So, making sure that I am matching exactly the dynamic that he finishes for me to start, getting louder and louder is essential to create an effect where it's almost like just one linear line here. The primary goal of the rehearsal is to make sure that we are giving the piece the best representation possible. The rehearsal process is complex and one hits hurdles and speed bumps along the way and it involves unpacking and dissecting. If you were to go to a rehearsal without the ability to listen or take in the input of others or the, I guess, <laughs> even the criticisms of others, there's no point of going to that rehearsal. It's, it's all about that sharing. It's a kind of a basic element of our, of our jobs to be able to be compassionate and, and to be able to communicate with your colleagues. Playing in a quartet is four equal musicians. As soon as you become dictatorial in a string quartet, like in any close relationship, the relationship becomes brittle, and of course things that are brittle break. You need to be flexible and open to criticism, and you need to be able to be critical to your colleagues in a very constructive way. Uh, we're overplaying again, aren't we? Where? At 19, I think we can be more. 19. Relaxing. One of the things I love is the collaboration. I feel as though I do have a say in how a piece will end up musically and we have discussions and sometimes they're heated and it would be a problem if they weren't because everybody's got a very strong opinion and so they should if they're a good enough musician. I think you could be a bit more there, Steph. Oh, just, okay, just, good. Should we go from 24? All good? I think working in a quartet, listening is everything. There should always be room for discovery in rehearsal. But mm, we, we should find the dynamic so that that is louder. Being open but strong in your own voice as well is the perfect mix that you can have as a musician. Richard, as the leader of the quartet, has to have a very, very strong vision about the sound that he wants and the colour and the interpretation of the piece and portray that strongly enough that we all can play together as one. One of the hard things about Richard's job is to listen to these individuals and their ideas and suggestions and from that collate a unified interpretation and that's the art of being a director and a leader, to show that clearly and to bring the other musicians along with you. So if I'm directing my friends and colleagues in the Australian Chamber Orchestra, I can allow for a more intimacy and relaxed atmosphere. Of course, rehearsal is about time. 
you don't have a lot of time. Uh, with stage actors preparing a play, often they have months, and that getting to know each other is very, very important. So there are a few goals. Obviously there are technical goals. You want it to be in tune together. Can we just do this, this and... Hey, and we should unpack this for the... Can we just look at the your harmony over this C-sharp pedal there? But if there's disharmony because you're not coordinating your tuning, you know, that's not acceptable, especially in a string quartet. When you're directing, you want to work on it so that you're feeling it with the same impetus, feeling phrases and beginnings of notes. Oh yeah, you go, and then, I still feel like I'm having to wait a little bit into the into the next article. Yeah, yeah. I think it should just bye. There's definitely one part of the rehearsal process which is the nitty-gritty, getting things together and finding the rhythm and making sure that it's together structurally. Hopefully, after not too long, you start accessing the musical side and the expression side, like what does the music say and what do you want to say with that piece of music? Understanding the music is a subjective thing because we can't really know exactly what the composer was thinking or what he or she meant, but you have to create your own understanding. And Ravel is you know, highly regarded for being a detailed composer with specific instructions telling you where to play, how to play, as though that doesn't leave room for imagination and interpretation. Seven after 21, the Mets of Forte still be strong. Don't be yeah. too weak, weak there. As a director, you need to question everything that the composer has written, absolutely everything. You go through every note, you make sure that there's consistency. That sounds great, very Spanish. Wow, see, it's much better. Whether they were right, whether you think that it made sense, whether it's written too softly, too loud, uh, whether you need more grit and vigour in the work. That's what rehearsal's about. There, that's, oh, I reckon you should change it to piano or something more. So, so that you really feel. Uh... To reassess it is really important. Can it be different? Should be different. Um, can it be better? Yeah. String quartet playing, it's constantly bouncing off someone else and listening to what they're saying and without being completely open and aware in the moment of what is happening, I think we can't be good chamber musicians somehow. A quartet is for individuals coming together. In a good quartet, you don't hear those individuals. You, you start to hear the collection uh, of those voices working in harmony together. Knowing as much as you can about how those instruments work as a performer helps without any question in the performance of quartet repertoire. So it's not like the quartet just has a bass, boom, 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 and then you have melody and a bit of harmony. Oh no, the composer could throw the melody to the cello and put the violins low. And that's the beauty of writing really at the pinnacle of quartet writing is that it's not just playing a melodic line with some oompa oompa accompaniment. If you remove those roles, ostensibly accompanying roles, it doesn't make sense. Playing a part, a single part alone, is vastly different from when you're in the larger context of a string quartet and often what sounds a particular way by yourself might sound vastly different when you're in the group. And here we have to look at this. So could we just, so the pedal is just this F, right? And then can we, can we add the, this arpeggiated thing? In this particular moment, Ravel used this really simple technique of the cello just playing this long F in the lower register for four bars. 
which creates this foundation for the other parts to sit on top of. There's a lot of different techniques happening at that moment um, in the in the other instruments. Finally, it's like really opened up and 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 uh, underneath all of that information happening, the cello is just playing this long F, and that note just has to be always adjusting and moving together with the other parts, enabling them to phrase their parts in a nice way. And even though it's just one note, it's constantly adjusted to accompany your colleagues in a better way. At this moment is a good example of how the cello's role changes within the moment from this supportive background actor in the first part into a more expressive and more vocal role in the lyrical middle section. And it's a very clever way of using all the different abilities of a, of a cello or the, all the different kind of functions that a cello has. If the cello is not noticed in the A section, that's a good thing. Like it's, it's just there supporting and maintaining the music. But then this quick transition to the middle section, this instrument or the person that has kind of gone unnoticed for the beginning of the movement, all of a sudden jumps to the foreground and is the person that transports us to another place. In my head, nothing really changes at that moment. You're still part of the score, part of the complete quartet. Performing is then another realm. So you can practice as much as you want, but as soon as you get in front of an audience, totally different um, scenario. It's a bit like a stand-up comedian. You can practice as much as you want in front of a mirror. You have no idea, no matter how much the person on the other side of the mirror might laugh at your jokes. You have no idea until you're in front of an audience. The feeling of performing is very hard to describe to people who don't do it on a regular basis. That five minutes before the concert is quite an exciting moment. As soon as those lights go on in the hall, no matter where it is, there's a sense of occasion. And it's up to us to create that sense of occasion. You want to be prepared for nerves, because if you're suddenly confronted with nerves and you're not used to it, it can be a terrifying experience. You can feel the energy of the audience, and it's a very exciting moment. The adrenaline starts chocking in. The audience is extremely important. We feed from their reaction. We sense often how they are feeling as a, as a collective. As artists, risk is hugely important. You always struggle for perfection and nothing's ever perfect. The imagination is the most important thing. The imagination and bringing the music to life. That's what it's for. Nobody wants to hear a boring performance, even if it is absolutely perfectly together. I'd much rather hear a few notes wrong or a few slips and this thing just ping to life. I mean, sometimes, we, sometimes we try something and fail, but at least we've tried it. Even in concerts on stage, you might just try something completely different. And sometimes you get, you know, really stinky looks from your colleagues that, what was that? Or sometimes it might just inspire someone to, to take the performance to uh, another place. As artists, we don't move people by just sitting on the fence. We need to somehow stand together and, and take the risk and trust each other. It is the moment that you let go and express yourself to an audience. We've made our sound and it's, it's out there and it's, it's gone.
Thank you. 